The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God, uh, may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we note, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Well, I've been talking about what Paul said as the spiritual life being analogous to a race. The difference being that in a race there is competition between runners. In the Christian way of life or when it comes to the spiritual life, there is no competition. One of the greatest distractions for believers in general and especially for the pastor teacher seems to be Inordinate competition and inordinate ambition. Inordinate means excessive. And when you get into any type of ambition against one another when you're on the same team, you've lost the race already because it's not about competition. And too many pastors want to see too many faces and consider that a competition. As a pastor, you have to have pure motivation that comes from your love for God. And therefore, there should be no type of competition between pastors. Many times, or sometimes, I'll mention how pastors, not by name, are failing that's only as an encouragement in case they come across one of my messages, which is possible. But it is not a competition. Also, it happens among the congregation. People get into competition with one another. We'll study this in great deal in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. We're all on the same team. So how is it that we run a race individually? Because we've all been given the same assets, equal privilege and equal opportunity. And one runner could be about to win the prize while another is just getting started. There could be a teenager just starting on the Word of God. They've just started running. There could be a 60-year-old or 70-year-old who's finished the race and is enjoying life and will soon depart to be with the Lord. So none of that has to do with competition. I know you laugh if you're in your 60s. What do you mean I'm about to depart to be with the Lord? <clears throat> exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, mores behind, many more years behind you than there are ahead of you. That's a certainty. And uh, I read in the news a hundred, there was a 107-year-old man. He got shot by the SWAT team. I guess he was senile and started shooting at everybody. So they shot him. He died by the police at the age of 107. He went out in a blaze. <laughs> Holy cow. Apparently he barricaded himself in, in his bedroom. He, obviously he had some uh, strength. 
and they were going to get in there, and he didn't want them in there, and he shot right through the door. Well, they held back on firing. They finally got him to open the door, and as soon as he did, he started shooting at them again. So they took him out. 107 years old. What a way to go. Anyway, it's not a competition. The spiritual life's not a competition. And along those lines, there was a priest, a, a Catholic priest minister, a Southern Baptist minister. Some of you may have heard about this, but a lot of others haven't. And a rabbi. And they were all at the bar. Of course, the Southern Baptist refrained. He was bombastic enough without alcohol, and he drank O'Doul's. The priest and the rabbi, they were at the bar and drank as they wished. And uh, the Southern Baptist preacher said they got in a conversation about converting people. And the Southern Baptist preacher, with his usual bombast and his usual ideas of competition, said, well, you know, I've converted more people than any of you. I bet you right now I could even convert a bear. Well, the rabbi and the priest took him up on it. Said, all right, I think we can convert a bear too. The Baptist preacher said, I know a place where there's some bears. Let's go out in the woods. I'll tell you where to go. You'll run into a bear. We'll see which one of us can convert. So they went out there and the Baptist and the rabbi and they said, well, who goes first? And they said, well, let's cast lots. And the Baptist says, no, I don't gamble. Um, let's, uh, uh, let's do it by vote. So they voted for the, uh, the priest to go first. So the priest goes out there. And he goes out into the stream where the bear usually comes to get his salmon. And there he found the bear. And he slowly walks up to the bear, grabs a handful of water, puts it in his holy water jar, and slings it at the bear. And the bear was a little angry, slapped him around a bit, but he got away. The priest came back, he had some scratches and some blood dripping here and there, and he said, uh, I converted that bear. I baptized him. Not only did I baptize him, I baptized him with holy water. The Baptist minister said, that's pretty good. I can convert that bear too. See, they're all in competition. So the Baptist minister gets out there and he's going to dunk that bear under the water. Baptize him. He walks up to the bear and the bear gets angry, slaps him around tears him up a bit, but he finally wrestles him under the water and the bear comes up out of the water and he says, I baptized him. So he comes limping back, clothes torn a bit. He says, it was rough, but I baptized that bear. It's your turn, Rabbi. The rabbi gets up sheepishly, goes out to the stream where the bear was still catching at salmon. Nobody heard from the rabbi for quite a while. Then finally they heard some moaning and groaning in the uh, bushes and they saw the rabbi crawling, blood sprinkled behind him, his face half disfigured. And they said, what happened? He said, I'll tell you one thing. Don't ever try to circumcise a bear. <laughs> well, that's what competition in the spiritual life will get you. Tore up to pieces. Not by a bear, but by the judgment of God. Now, I don't teach every day out of a competition with other pastors or to say, hey, look what I can do because when I learned the Word of God, 
I learned under the faithfulness of a man who taught on a daily basis in his younger years, sometimes far more than that, so that I might have the ability to grow in the grace and the knowledge of my Lord and Savior. And he wasn't in competition with anyone either. In fact, you get a lot more grief the more doctrine you put out. And everyone looks at it suspiciously. Why are you doing that? And it's all because in their minds, they would have a motivation different from pure motivation. A lot of times. Why would somebody do that? And they do that and they won't even accept money? There must be something more to it. Approbation lust? Inordinate competition? What is it? It's a pure love for the Word of God and a love for you and everyone who listens so that they can grow to maturity. A love for this country so we can as it were, get back to our roots. Love for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sense of responsibility. All of those things are factored in as pure motivation. Well, in eschatology, there are four great judgments. The first being that Jesus Christ will come down at the second advent and in the baptism of fire remove all unbelievers from the earth so that believers only will begin in the millennium with Jesus Christ as ruler so there will be a restoration of virtue and values in the millennium starting out with all believers and as civilizations go if you mark it out in terms of these judgments, you will find the same thing. In the great deluge, the flood, you will find that toward the end of that uh, pre, the at the end of the uh, antediluvian civilization, you will find that the only people who are left are eight believers. After the flood, the only people who are left are believers, period. So civilization began after the flood with believers only. And at the second advent, the next great prophetical event in eschatology, as far as judgments go, there will be the beginning of the millennium with believers only. The next great judgment will come at the end of the millennium. As a thousand years go by, even though Jesus Christ reigns on the earth, there will be a degeneration in the thinking of the populace. The populace will end up as one-third unbeliever, two-thirds believer. They will revolt in the Gog and Magog revolution against perfect environment, against Jesus Christ. And as a result, there will be the judgment and the removal of all unbelievers from the earth. Then there will be the great white throne judgment. And in the great white throne judgment, all unbelievers in Hades will be resurrected into their own resurrection body that will be able to handle the heat and the torments of the lake of fire and they will be sentenced to the lake of fire because they rejected Jesus Christ. And then the last and final judgment will be the destruction of planet earth and the entirety of the universe. What survives all these four judgments is that which has true value. And what survives these four great judgments will be the believer, both winner and loser, both by grace. The resurrection body will survive 
the greatest nuclear holocaust in all of history. We will see it. We'll be there. What else survives? The Word of God abides forever. The Word of God survives. Of course, the Trinity survives. The elect angels survive. Everything that has value survives. Your eternal rewards survive. Those who have no eternal rewards, their eternal rewards will survive on deposit. So everything with value survives. Everything on this earth of value today is temporal. Gold will not even survive. The gold standard won't survive the great nuclear holocaust found in 2 Peter chapter 3. Gold, silver, and precious stone on the earth, all gone. The earth, all gone. The stars in the sky, all gone. All of it, gone. What's left? You, me, believers in Christ. Those things of value. Bible doctrine. So since Bible doctrine is going to survive all of this, and we're going to survive all of this, don't you think we should have a relationship with the Word of God since it's going to be with us forever and ever and ever and ever? The answer is yes. And if you on the earth make Bible doctrine number one priority in your life, you're going to have personal impact. You're going to have things of value occur. You are going to have a blessing by association to others. They won't even know about it. If they're mature believers, they may know about it. Blessing by association with the invisible hero, therefore, will include the following peripheries. If you move to spiritual maturity, this is what occurs. You become a blessing by association to number one, the family. Husband, wife, mother, father, children, relatives. And yes, even your pets, for the beast of the righteous shall be blessed. Number two, you'll be a blessing to organizations. Whatever organization you're affiliated with or with which you are affiliated, correct English, that would be businesses, schools, teams, law firms, medical clinics, military organizations, law enforcement, engineering firms, banks, symphony orchestras, or any other legitimate organization. Number three, you'll be a blessing by association to those in your social circle involving all those in your social life they will be blessed number four there is geographical blessing by association that incurs the ble occur, uh, includes the blessing of your neighborhood your city your county your state and your nation <clears throat> so historical impact is defined as blessing by association to the Gentile client nation through the formation of the pivot of mature believers. As we've studied, the client nation to God has certain distinct characteristics. It has freedom that includes equal rights before the law, the freedom to evangelize, it includes a large number of believers existing in the nation. A portion of these believers execute the spiritual life of the church age as the pivot of mature believers. Now we do have a large portion of believers in the United States of America. The true problem is with those believers because too few 
are executing this unique spiritual life and they've exchanged their spiritual freedom for a mess of pottage. They don't want to listen to the reproof and correction of the Word of God. They don't want to know even about God and they definitely don't want to know about their unique spiritual life. They're too busy in the energy of the flesh doing what they do and loving the cosmic system. Anything related to the spiritual life is foreign to them. Now what I'm going to do as part of uh, teaching, I'm still going to teach uh, what I'm teaching now and then move back to Acts. But one thing I'm going to do is make sure that the vocabulary of Christendom is understood so that there's no excuse. Now I did the essential series, but to me it's not that it, it's good. You can learn from it and it will be on the website until I complete on the side when I have time and when I am able. I'm going to begin a study called the vocabulary of Christendom because Christians lack a vocabulary related to the unique spiritual life. I'm going to start with salvation, explain it as part of our vocabulary. Immediately after that I'm going to go to rebound. Rebound will be in our nomenclature. So that if I want while teaching, I can simply say, and then they rebounded, and move on without having to explain rebound every time, though I may because of the importance of 1 John 1, 9, but rebound will be taught as vocabulary. Also, as part of vocabulary, there will be the teaching of the Trinity. Basic things like that all the way up through post-salvation, post epistemological rehabilitation, the ten problem-solving devices, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics. Explain in detail what these things mean. The cosmic system, the divine dinosphere, this would be far later in the vocabulary series. The hypostatic union, dispensations, the faith rest drill, grace orientation, doctrinal orientation, personal sense of destiny. All of this is part of a vocabulary of Christendom. Regeneration, reconciliation, propitiation, regeneration. All of these things will be part of a series that will be done on the side and when it's complete it will replace essentials. For the newcomer, there will be the gospel message. Following that, the vocabulary of Christendom, which will replace all the essentials that I did, which are good, but not good enough in my estimation. And then, uh, following that, once I get a hold of, once again, I lost systematic theology. The most terrible thing ever for one to lose, but in all the moves that I've had in life, I misplaced systematic theology written by Lewis Berry Schaefer. I'm going to try to re, uh, purchase that once again. And then uh, as part of that, there will be a study on theological concepts. These studies will be on the side and may take a long time to accomplish, but uh, that's something that I'm looking into doing for sure. And definitely to have the vocabulary of the spiritual life so that when I teach these things I don't have to stop and try to explain and I'm going to put it in a way there where it starts from the most basic all the way to the most advanced 
So that when I go over something, all I have to do is say, refer to lesson so-and-so, if you don't know what this means. And to make it almost like a catalog, so it is easy for the believer, if interested, to find out exactly what something means, because I understand if you're coming in and listening and these things sound foreign to you. It would be like me going into calculus when I did, when I was in college, I took a calculus course. I looked at the textbook, that was all foreign to me. And then my professor was foreign and could barely speak English with such a thick brogue French accent. I couldn't understand him. I tried to learn calculus through a textbook. That's impossible. Tantamount to trying to learn theology by reading the Bible on your own. Impossible. So I dropped out of that class quickly because I knew there was no way. Dropped out before I could be graded. <laughs> and that's the way to do it. Especially when you know that this isn't going right for me and I'm not paying. If you drop out quick enough, you don't have to pay. And I'm not paying for a class where the guy doesn't speak English and what I'm looking at in the book looks like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. And if you've ever taken calculus, you know exactly what I mean. It deals with things outside of our frame of reference. So those are the plans for the immediate future, along with some other things I've got going on. I won't talk about any of that until it actually comes to fru fruition. In the church age, we do live in the times of the Gentiles. It's found in Luke 21, 24, Romans 11, 25, which talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. All of this is referencing the invisible heroes of the church age and these invisible heroes, by the way, will reign with Christ in the millennium. They will reign with Christ in the millennium. Now, right now you might be a peon in life. Most of us are. Very few get any type of position and leadership and power. Most people are under leadership and authority, some system of power, and that's normal. It's especially so for the believer because our Lord himself said, said not many mighty are called. So you look up here at this short little man Say, where did he come from? Not many mighty are called. That's where I came from. From the not many mighty. A few mighty are called. Nebuchadnezzar was called, but he was so mighty that his might had to be broken down because of his arrogance combined with the might. So much so that he went mad and started eating grass like cattle. And after seven years of doing that, he changed his mind and decided to believe in Christ. There was a mighty man named Saul of Tarsus. He had to meet Jesus Christ personally in his resurrection body and be blinded before he would accept Christ. So due to arrogance, not many mighty are called. That's why our Lord said it's very difficult for the rich man to believe in Christ. That's what he means by saying going through the eye of the needle. The eye of the needle is not the sewing machine needle that we think of today, but it was a narrow gate in which the animals had a hard time getting through. Well, the wealthy have a hard time getting through because they're mighty and they depend so heavily on their wealth. And in the Christian way of life, if you go through prosperity testing, 
as our nation has and has failed, you become like the, you have the potential to become like the Laodicean. I was studying last night, could be why, I was a bit tired earlier today, that the prosperity test is a necessary test to move on to maturity and to move on through the momentum testing. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I thought I already went through momentum testing. Well, I guess I better go buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> After studying it in more detail, I do not think that the prosperity test is a necessity to go through momentum testing. But prosperity test is definitely part of, or could be part of, your life. Maybe you've already had it and failed it. Maybe you had it and passed it. But uh, maybe I've had it and didn't know it because prosperity comes in all different forms. Approbation. Receiving the approbation of people is a form of prosperity. There has been times or a time in my life when I received, received a great deal of approbation. That's a form of prosperity. You either pass it or fail it though. You either get distracted by that approbation or you stick with the Word of God and realize that it's enjoyable but worthless in the end. It also includes romance and marriage. Having a good romance and a good marriage. That can be part of prosperity. So it's not just money. Nowadays I think prosperity test money. Romance and marriage, done that a couple of times. <laughs> Some people don't think that's funny. Are you a legalist? I'm just waiting for somebody one day to ask me, Hey, how are you a pastor? And you're supposed to be the... You know, a pastor's only supposed to be with the one wife, as it says in the Bible. Well, how about no wife? Does that count? No, no, I mean... You've been married twice. Yeah? What that verse means is you can't have two women with at the same time. Polygamy. Saying you can't be a pastor and a polygamist at the same time. Well, shoot. You wouldn't have time. That's all that means. And legalists go way overboard on that one. And with the divorce rate as high as it is, I figure I'll relate very well to my congregation and uh, I hope to keep as many legalists out as possible this is one way hey I've been married twice and uh, also if I'm well never mind I'll save it in case it ever happens in front of you you can get a good laugh I already know what I'm gonna say Anyway, as I was talking about prosperity, I got a double portion of that in romance and marriage. How's that for you? <laughs> oh boy. Some things I can't say. And then uh, there's uh, not only romance and uh, that, but there's uh, approbation lust that can be part of it. Well, I've had all those things. Uh, so the, when I think of prosperity testing, I think money, because I've never really had money. Probably for good reason. Might end up with five wives. Different. <laughs> reason why I talk like this is, yeah, and no money. The only reason I talk like this is not to make fun of a divine establishment to make fun of myself and, and to let you know I'm a human being too. 
and uh, period. And if you put me on a pedestal, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And uh, I feel for you if you put me on a pedestal. I mean, if you put me on a pedestal because of my height, that's one thing. But if you think I'm something special, you're wrong. I'm graced out just like you are. And I happen to have the gift of pastor teacher, so you should listen anyway. I remember when uh, I had dinner with Colonel Arby Theme Jr. And yes, I did have dinner with Colonel Arby Theme Jr. Didn't know him personally. Never met his son. But uh, I did have dinner with him. And uh, one of the things Katie said was that... Uh, because they were mentioning the fact that Colonel Theme had been playing in my household since the time I was in diapers. And then Katie mentioned the fact that she said, yeah, a lot of people who grew up listening to Colonel Arby Theme never saw him face to face. When they would go to a conference or come to Baraka Church in their early teens or something like that, they would hear his voice and associate it now with his face and they would say it's God <laughs> well she thought that was funny the colonel despised what she had said and kind of slapped at the table as if he wanted to slap her hand and said no Katie he was pretty disgusted by all that because he was no God well, she was making a joke but it just didn't sit right with him because he's not God. Well, if you know Katie, you know how flamboyant she is or was. I don't know if she's still alive or not. Anyway, through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, the believer executes the protocol plan of God and advances to spiritual maturity, becoming both an invisible hero and a member of the pivot of the client nation. The size of the pivot of invisible heroes and the number of those who reach Pleroma status determines the blessing or cursing of that nation and the history of that nation. You are a current event, and you as a born-again believer, either in maturity or moving to maturity, you have influence on tomorrow's headlines. And right now, it's obvious there are too few having a great enough influence to affect the horrible headlines of which I've given you a sample of throughout this series of freedom. I got tired of reading the bad news, so I took a break from it today. It's all the same thing over and over and over again. So a large pivot of invisible heroes means national blessing and prosperity in spiritual affairs as well as in the function of government. Obviously, no blessing by association. Or in the function of law enforcement, military modus operandi. operandi. There's been a great deal of blessing by association to the military, the United States military. Still the best crack army in the world. The economy is also part of what will be blessed. Obviously, there's failing there. And in cultural and social life of the nation, that's been screwed up for a long time. When the pivot of invisible heroes and believers in Pleroma becomes too small in a client nation to have much impact, this will bring about the administration of the five cycles of discipline Right now, we're under the third cycle of discipline. We'll go over quickly Leviticus 26, verse 14 through 38, as I went through it yesterday. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring upon you sudden terror wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. 
You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. Third cycle of discipline. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Fourth cycle of discipline. Those who hate you will rule over you. Fourth cycle of discipline. And you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If after all of this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze, the coming of the third cycle of discipline. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crop, nor the trees or the land yield their fruit, the actual function in the third cycle of discipline. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals, criminal elements within the society, terrorist elements from without that have infiltrated the land through lack of military vigilance. That will be sent against you. They will rob you of your children, kidnapping, selling of children into slavery or the sex trade, Phoenix, Arizona is known as the kidnapping capital of the world, for example. Destroy your cattle and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. All of that part of the fourth cycle of discipline. 23. If in spite of these things you do not accept my correction but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword on you to, do, to avenge the breaking of the covenant. When you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you, and you will be given into the hands of your enemy. When I cut off your supply of bread, ten women will be able to bake bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight, rationing of food. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. Hunger. So that here we see an intensification of the fourth cycle of discipline. Along with that, there's an intensification of the first cycle of discipline, social degeneration, terrorism, along with the second cycle of discipline, intensification of the third cycle of discipline, economic turmoil. And then finally, we have the fifth cycle of discipline. If in spite of this, you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger, of course, we noted that as an anthropopathism. I will be hostile toward you, and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters, absolute destruction of any type of cultural and social life in the country. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. Anything that you held in importance above Bible doctrine, You'll fall over dead on it. It's meaningless. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries. Everybody will run to church, but nobody will have anything to say. And I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. There'll be no delight from the Lord as you go to church to pray. Your prayers will not be heard. It's too late. You didn't learn how to rebound. You did not learn any of the concepts related to your unique spiritual life in this church age. And therefore, you have hardness of heart. There's no hope for you. And if you go to church, not even the pastors will know what to say. I myself will lay lace to the land so that your enemies who live there, even those who, who came in there to live during the fourth cycle of discipline, they too will be appalled. Now we skip to verse 40. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors. This simply means if they confess their sins, their own personal sins. I want you to listen to this. It's a bit of a modification. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors. This is what this means. When they name their personal sin to God. It's the same sins their ancestors committed. That's all. Sin natures are the same from generation to generation. They're not actually saying, Father, I have committed this. My father committed this too, and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, so I'm naming all of the sins to you of them. No. Simply by naming their own sin, they're naming the sin of the grandfather too 
and of their father and of their great grandfather. Why? They all committed the same sins. That's all it means. So what they do is name their own sin to God. By doing so, they're also naming the sins of their ancestors. That's what it's saying. So that should be easy enough to understand. You see, there are idioms and certain things in language that we have to come to understand. Hebrew is no different. Simply saying, when you name your own sins, hey, you're going to be naming the sins of your grandfather, your father, your grandmother, anyone who was in the past under the concept of the four-generation curse. I didn't get it wrong yesterday. I just didn't explain it in enough detail because it does deal with the four-generation curse. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors because they're the same, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then we're, when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and when they pray, rebound, as the first act of humility in any given dispensation of the believer, I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. And I want you to notice it goes backwards. Instead of saying, I will remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's a reverse. I remember my covenant with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Why? It's no mistake. Can you think about it? Come to a conclusion? Why is it in reverse? Most of the times you hear about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why suddenly is it Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham? Well, I'm not going to ask you a question because it makes you object. I'm not going to make you answer out loud. It makes you subjective. And if you know the answer, it has a possibility to make you subjectively arrogant, etc. I'm asking it rhetorically. I'll give you the answer. Because earlier, guess what they were doing? They named their own sins. They're the newest of the generations. Jacob was the newest of the generation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it goes in reverse, because Jacob was the newest. So it's a reflection of what they're doing, in that they're naming their sins, and there'll be a recovery of the land as the newest generation. So the newest generation, Jacob, so what they do in Hebrew is they flip it around, and it's fantastic, really, when you think about it. So it goes backwards this time, <clears throat> and it's, a back, it's backwards, it's almost like trying to count backwards from three when you think about it because it's done so rarely. I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. So in Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people who are called by my name, the client nation to God, will humble themselves, the first act of humility in the Christian way of life, and for believers in the Old Testament was to rebound, to name their sins to God, and pray, that's the naming of the sins, and seek my face, that's an idiom for seeking Bible doctrine, and turn from their wicked ways, that's turning from the wrongdoing of any type of system they functioned under, which was antithetical to God's system, which always includes the four divine institutions of volition, mar volition, marriage, family, and government, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So a large pivot of invisible heroes, mature believers, along with those who have reached Pleroma to Theu, means the five cycles of discipline are canceled, and the nation is delivered by the grace of God. Now since our nation is still alive, Though we are hanging by a thread, we right now have the gracious opportunity once again evangelize 
and for me to teach Bible doctrine and for you to listen to Bible doctrine so that a new generation of believers might deliver this nation just as many times in history a new generation has delivered not only our own nation but has delivered the nation of Israel itself in the past. The principle is, as goes the Pleroma believer, so goes the client nation to God historically, spiritually, economically, culturally, and socially, all mentioned in the previous verses that we studied. When the pivot shrinks through apostasy, the client nation declines. It is eventually destroyed by the fifth cycle of discipline. The last form of impact that we have for the believer who reaches maturity is international impact. International impact. It will be international impact is defined as blessing by association to a non-client nation through missionaries who have attained spiritual maturity. Missionaries who have international impact are those believers who are consistent in the cognition of Bible doctrine under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit and their right pastor. Many missionaries are disqualified from international impact because they are works oriented through their production skills and lack spiritual skills. In other words, they've forsaken their spiritual life. They've gotten too far into the works and therefore have abandoned their spiritual life, which is the very motivation to do a job with pure motivation and to do it correctly as far as missionary activity is concerned. The missionary, who's an invisible hero, will have a dual impact of blessing by association in history. For one thing, the mature missionary is a blessing to the client nation from which he comes. The mature missionary is a blessing to the foreign nation to which he goes. And when the invisible hero goes to a foreign country as a missionary, he becomes a source of blessing by association to that non-client nation so that it prospers. The mature missionary does not interfere with the politics. He does not interfere with the culture. He does not interfere with any function in that non-client nation through Christian activism, which is both evil and part of moral degeneration. This has been a problem with our men, uh, missionary activities since the time before World War II even. Legalism has destroyed the effectiveness of missionary activity. So the result of invisible impact is two categories of blessing by association. Now of course what the missionary should do there is true evangelism in the foreign country. That's number one. Number two, there is teaching Bible doctrine to the converts. And number three, there's the establishment of local churches and training in the spiritual gifts. So the result of invisible international impact is two categories of blessing by association. Now, spiritual prosperity comes from evangelism, the training of national pastors, and the formation of a self-sustaining local church or local churches in that nation or the region in which they utilize their missionary activity. The national prosperity comes without activism, without interference into their culture, without social engineering, without getting the people involved in civil disobedience, terrorism, or revolution. There's angelic impact as defined as the invisible hero becoming a witness for the prosecution in the rebuttal phase of Satan's appeal trial during human history. This witness is accomplished by the attainment of spiritual maturity and by the mature believer passing evidence testing. 
The importance of this invisible impact is based on the fact that the church age is the only prolonged period of human history where the angelic conflict is totally invisible. Angels were visible and will be visible in every other dispensation except our own. That's something for you to ponder. When people become believers in Jesus Christ and execute the protocol plan of God, they are applauded by the elect angels. Angels cheer when someone becomes an invisible hero. I want to ask you something. If you're the type who likes approbation, I don't know if you are or not. Most people like it in some way. And as long as it's not a lust, it's all right to have it. But what would you rather have? The applause of man or the applause of the elect angels? I know which I would rather have, even though I can't hear them clap. You can't have both in terms of if you lust for approbation, you're not going to be clapped at by angels. You've exchanged the clapping of angels for the clapping of man. In other words, You've exchanged your spiritual heritage for a mess of pottage. Mankind was thus created to resolve the prehistoric angelic conflict. So right now, angels are observing human history. In the dispensation of the hypostatic union, angels observed the incarnation. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Well, how an hour does fly by so quickly. Well, I'll go over this verse, since you're already turning there, in which we will note that angels observe the hypostatic union, our Lord in incarnation. 1 Timothy 3.16. An hour goes by awfully quickly when you're having fun or sleeping, either way. 1 Timothy 3.16 Beyond all question, the mystery from which the true, true unique spiritual life springs greatly, he appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And in this dispensation of the church age, angels are observing you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us and challenge us to those things which we have gone over. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.